It is the eve, the exciting eve of our rediscovery of South America. The next morning, and the excitement continues, for before us lies the harbor of Rio de Janeiro, as amazing to every newcomer as it must have been to his discoverer, Gonzalo Coelho, on New Year's Day in 1502. The world over, there's no setting like this for a city. A landlocked harbor, deep, safe, and immensely large, nowhere is its equal. A waterfront miles long, in and above and around everything, an incredible juxtaposition of sea, plain, and mountain. In making this place ready for its settlers, nature really outdid herself. For the people of Rio have the ocean at their front doors, while from their city streets rise slopes and peaks, such as most countries look for only in their remote wilds. Yet between the mountainous masses, there is room for a metropolis, a Rio of almost two million. It's larger than Detroit or Los Angeles. It has a million more people than Boston. It is exceeded in size only by New York, Chicago, and Philadelphia in North America, and in South America, only by Buenos Aires. It has its old quarter, too, for there has been a town here since 1565. This is right in the city also, Copa Cabana Beach. No long drives or train rides for a bay in the Atlantic. If you say water city, you'll be quite right. We're seeing this because, by good luck, we happen to be in Rio for Mardi Gras. The chief glory of Rio de Janeiro remains the fantasy of nature, which is its setting. At the entrance of the bay is the city's best known landmark, the great granite shaft known as Pau de Açúcar, Sugarloaf Mountain, 1,200 feet high. We are standing a full thousand feet higher, beside the lofty statue of Christ, which surmounts Corcovado. Such is the capital and chief city of that self-contained empire which we know as Brazil. Here is the gateway to a country which is as big as continental United States, plus another Texas. A country larger than any other on Earth except China, Russia, and Canada. A country which embraces 47% of all of South America. A country of 45 millions of people. Santos, which is an overnight trip of 225 miles south from Rio by water, is the world's greatest coffee port. A major portion of Brazil's coffee sets out from here for foreign markets, and Brazil's coffee is nearly three-fifths of all the coffee there is. Someone has laboriously computed that the coffee leaving these wharves in a single year would give every man, woman, and child in the United States one cup a day for 14 and a half months and very good coffee, too. Santos is the port of entry and export for the state of Sao Paulo, the industrial center of Brazil, so the exports are not confined to coffee. Most of the coffee goes to New York for marketing and distribution. Before the Second World War, Hamburg ranked second as a coffee market. Coffee accounts for nearly half of all Brazil's exports. She keeps plenty of it, however, for home consumption. Some of the folks in this state of Sao Paulo drink as many as 15 to 20 cups a day. 
Heading inland to the city of Sao Paulo, which is 40 miles from the coast, we find the road climbing steeply. We look back to Santos and the coast. We are on the edge of a plateau, which is curiously tilted inland. Because of this tilt, rivers which rise within a few miles of the coast may flow inland and wander about for more than 2,000 miles before they reach the sea. Here, however, engineering skill has caused one of these rivers to flow backwards and to fall suddenly over a precipitous drop to give the city of Sao Paulo its electrical energy. An amazing city, this Sao Paulo. Though the capital, Rio de Janeiro, is less than 300 miles away, Sao Paulo is really the commercial and industrial center, not only of Brazil, but of all South America. It has a million people and boasts not only that big coffee trade, but industries which produce textiles, glass, metal products, flour, furniture, shoes, and lots of other things, including matches. And Sao Paulo is an amazing exhibition of modern buildings. Every day sees new structures completed in this brisk place. At Sao Paulo's Butantan Institute, the famous medically inspired snake ranch, here, poisonous reptiles live in palatial quarters and are induced to yield their venom so that serums can be made to combat the activities of other poisonous reptiles. Every year, thousands of Brazilian plantation workers are bitten by snakes. The scientists at Butantan have cut the death rate way down. Some of the venom supplied, not too willingly, by Butantan's star borders is used in combating smallpox and diphtheria. This business is all a great surprise to the snake, who never had any intention of using his venom in this way. And after it happens to him two or three times, he quits, he just dies. And then they can go and get their venom from some other snake. The lilies at the forestry gardens at Sao Paulo. See whether or not you can observe a straight line cutting across the landscape. You probably can. But if you could, it would be the Tropic of Capricorn. Here's where it is. One of the amazing things about Brazil, indeed one of the amazing things about this planet, is the Amazon River. What we call the Amazon is a vast system of watercourses reaching nearly 4,000 miles into the interior. A mile and a half wide at some places, for 2,300 miles the river is navigable to ocean-going vessels. And then, beyond that, it traverses vast reaches of forests, swamp, and brushland, which to this day are largely uncharted, unsettled, mysterious. Cattle ranching has gained some foothold on the island of Moraju, set in the mouth of the Amazon. The fact that this island is larger than the entire country of Belgium is a hint of how normal ideas of size undergo strain when you're in the Amazon country. Belém, 75 miles from the coast, is the gateway to the great interior of the Amazon plain. The people here have the satisfaction of knowing that they are citizens of no mean city. There are nearly 300,000 of them, and their town is the chief distributing point for the whole vast Amazon valley. And someday it will be a really busy port. For in front of it is the lower Amazon and its mouth, a gateway to the world. While back of it, stretching into the interior, is one of the few remaining great untouched frontiers. Up the river are endless hot lands. Lands that will remain forbidding until ways are found to conquer jungles and their widely assorted scourges. But as we ponder over the Amazon and its unsolved mysteries, we remember that here, if anywhere, is a great challenge to man's pioneering impulses. Land, good land, endless miles of it, 
someday to be made habitable and productive. The vast interior of Brazil, when that day comes, will support a population running into hundreds of millions. To look up the Amazon is one way of looking into the future. It is the eve, the exciting eve of our rediscovery of South America. The next morning, and the excitement continues, but before us lies the harbor of Rio. She really outdid herself. For the people of Rio have the ocean at their front doors, while from their city streets rise slopes and peaks, such as most countries look for only in Rio de Janeiro. As amazing to every newcomer as it must have been to his discoverer, Gonzalo Coelho, on New Year's Day in 1502. The front miles long in and above and around everything, an incredible juxtaposition of sea, plain, and mountain. In making this place ready for its settlers, the world over, there's no setting like this for a city. A landlocked harbor, deep, safe, and immensely large, nowhere is its equal. A